pastel colors. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Irenacast. I'm Jeff. It's your boy, Alan. I'm Bonnie. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives. On theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, Rajiv and Casey are on assignment And those of us that remain are going to be discussing stages of growth. And we're bringing to you a new segment called Classy or Trashy, which should be uh, fun and ridiculous, like many of our segments are. And we're excited about that. So what do we mean stages of growth? This particular topic was put together by Alan. So I'm going to I'm going to throw it over to Alan and he's going to guide us through what we mean, what we're talking about when we say stages of growth. So, Alan, it is it is the, the floor is yours, sir. Let me just sit with that for a minute. It feels really good. <laughs> we don't offer it to you very often, so <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I, at the risk of having a very broad conversation, I think that's what this topic risks at the moment. I have reached a place in my life where I respect developmental language around growth and recognizing that there are moments in my life where I'm at different places and I'm not ready for something or um, I have been ready for something and I'm leaving something else. And we talk about those in general terms on this, on this podcast, but I kind of wanted to turn a spotlight toward that and just talk about stages of development in general, specifically in my mind for the spiritual journey. Are there places that we've arrived at in our spiritual journey or are we headed to, do we have language for what that means? Uh, is it helpful to think of it in terms of, of stages? And I, I know Bonnie's read a lot about different theories and ways that things have been put together. And Jeff and I've had some really good conversations around um, different typologies for how to look at life or how we function in the world. And I'm just wondering if we could kind of glean from all these different things. What is the typology that, kind of works for you? Uh, How do you make sense of your life right now where you're at and your journey? Do you have language that kind of shapes this phase that you're in or where you're headed or where you've come from? And I've particularly been reading a few books that use different types of terminology. So I'm excited to embrace this, uh, to embrace it as a minister, to embrace it as a friend, like realizing that everybody's in different places and recognizing and holding that is part of being in good community. So, and then maybe we could talk about it from a personal place and then look at communities as a whole, like can communities as a whole be on different places in the developmental journey? Huge topic, (laughs) but I think for our listeners, this could be something extremely useful. And my hope is not that we would explore the whole topic and get everything right. Like just setting that to the side completely. I'm hoping to pick up little pieces that I can kind of integrate into my life. And I think listeners would be excited for that too. I mean, I think I, and I'm trying to remember back to my um, more fundamentalist evangelical days and think about the way that this idea was talked about within that community. I mean, other than the binary of like saved or not saved, like becoming closer to emulating Jesus. I don't know of any other language that I really like inherited about this kind of progression, perhaps. I mean, I heard language around like spiritual journey and, but more in a progressive Christian world than I think I did in the evangelical fundamentalist world of seventh day Adventism, which is the community of my formation. What about you guys? Ours was biblical and less biblical. Yeah, there's the journey from like, I I love that you're framing it that way. So yeah, the journey was either you're a Christian or not, and there's the transition to becoming a Christian. And then once you're a Christian for the the group the group that I grew up with, it was a journey from being a Christian. I think the the New Testament text they used a lot was I've given you spiritual milk and you're not ready for meat or something like that. And so move on from that to the more meaty things. And so the entirety of the human journey was 
um, moving from being a non-biblical Christian or something to a more quote unquote biblical Christian who eats the meat of, of what Christianity means. And I, I think beyond that, there was no developmental language used in any of my uh, faith groups that I grew up in. I would say even outside of faith, there's not developmental language anywhere. I, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's always evolutionary language. Like you're moving on, you're moving past something. And when I was growing up in my spiritual context, there was like a, uh, a growth hierarchy, right? So you got saved and then you strove for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And those that were special, when they got saved, they also got baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was like this next level. It was like a... The way that it was always described to me, it was like this, this supercharge. Like now you kind of have all the tools that you need to be together. And until you really get to that place, then you're not, your ministry isn't going to be as full as it could because you, you know, you're not acting in the gifts of the spirit or, or whatever. Uh, so in, in, in my Pentecostalism, there was always like a, it was a, it was a, um, it was revelatory. Like you, you get to another place and something else will be revealed to you. So you were like stepping up in these journeys and your, your ultimate goal was to be 100% in the will of God. So basically <laughs> the goal in the spirituality that I was brought up is to be the perfect puppet. <laughs> that was the only way that I could describe it now that I'm thinking back to it. Um, but there was that whole, that whole hierarchical language, like it's, it's a journey and every, everything is a step up, a step forward. And any time that you stepped back, you were not in God's will. You were in sin. It was something that was keeping you back. And I've, and I've held on to that. And that's not just because of my upbringing. I think that's my American culture that I was born into is that any step backwards, anything that's not a success, that's a failure, then you are, you're, you're, you're diminishing your growth potential as opposed to moving it forward. And I know we'll talk about this more as we have the conversation going, but it wasn't until I was introduced to the idea of uh, spiral dynamics. We've mentioned this a long time in the show, but just to know that there's fluidity in our stations in life and our quote unquote growth, even the idea of the word growth is, is problematic for me, but I don't know other places where I can adopt other language. And I always default to that. And it's really difficult. Mm-hmm. Because what is growth? Like, yeah, I think the word maturity, which is, is, is in that same text, I think that um, mm -hmm. you were referencing, Alan, of, of like milk to solid foods and until you've achieved this fullness of our spiritual maturity in Christ or something like that. Bef before we move from what Jeff just said, um, I, I, I'm getting triggered for the whole growth mentality thing. And I think you're right in pointing out it's not just religious communities that do this. There are entire programs for people that are very focused on their self-growth, on maximizing their time every single day to to make the most profit or wh whatever it is, whatever scheme they have for. Um, I, I was having a conversation recently about the term higher consciousness. Like, I think higher consciousness is a thing. Uh, and, I, and I think there are there's growth and development toward that. But I hate that phrase. It just hits me the wrong way. And I couldn't figure out why. And I was, I was talking to my friend. And what I came to was the reason I hate the term higher consciousness is I just imagine, you know, the bro who's kind of grinding through capitalism to get like to maximize his potential as a sexual being and is like this person making money and all this stuff. And higher consciousness is just a piece of uh, enlarging the ego. Whereas like higher consciousness is the opposite of that. It's like transcending some of that to connect with other people and, and, the, and all of life and to access these places of meaning that are not just self-serving. So hearing, hearing growth, I think Jeff, you were saying growth is a word that's like tricky sometimes depending on the context. I feel that Bonnie, how would you define maturity? Like, I, I think one of the questions I wrote down uh, ahead of time for this is how do we define maturity? And I think that's part of the, the process is figuring out what that even means for us, but it's such a nebulous term. Right. And I think it's related to the definition of growth, which, you know, which has a lot of layers of implications in terms of like who decides what growth is, um, who decides what maturity is. I think in, in most of our contexts, previous contexts, faith community contexts, and maybe even American contexts, there's this idea that 
you're only you only partially determine where you're headed next. I mean, there's there's right. God has a whole lot to do with where you're headed and whether or not you're. I don't know. You're you're one of the elect or not one of the elect. Whether or not you're you're going to achieve the next level or not achieve the next level or have to stay in a certain place for a long time before you can make it to the next level. And I think that we we have ideas about that um, in relation to the broader society. So, like, I think you know, maturity. What does that What does that even mean? That it depends. It depends on the context from which one speaks about it, which is, I think, what's problematic about having conversations about developmental theory Hmm. is that somehow there's this idea that um, human development is universal and that we can kind of name what the stages are for human development. And that's the biggest criticism of developmental theory, of which I spend a lot of time studying. So it's, you know, I'm just naming a criticism of something that I love to learn about and work with. Um, And that is that you can't say for everybody and every cultural context, what the stages are. That's well said. Or what the goal of development is. And maturity would be the goal of what development, you know, where we're trying to get to. Well, that depends that depends on so much. I think it is problematic and it's necessary. Like as a community, we're already setting standards for our children, for adolescents, for ourselves as to what communally we recognize as stages of growth. I think we're doing it or we're letting someone else set the pace for us in, in, the, in that way. But I think you're touching on something really profound those societies and systems that try to determine what like humanity means and then make everyone conform to that have been atrocious in the last 150 years. There's, you know, the eugenics movement and fascist place, you know, fascist dictatorships where they're telling people, this is what it means to be a good human or a superhuman or something. And there's no room for people who think differently. So, yeah, I think, I think, that is, it's really problematic to say that this applies to everyone equally. I think of it more, maybe because I'm a millennial or something, like a toolbox that I can just play around with, like for myself and with other people to see if it brings some sort of value or, or help um, along the way. Like when we think about ourselves and other people, like what's some of the, what's some of the language that works for us in terms of journey? Like Jeff, you mentioned spiral dynamics, like is that just a set thing or is it something that people transition through? Like, is the, so I, I never read spiral dynamics, but I heard it was really uh, important. And I read some like cliff notes on it, but is that where like there's different types of people and they kind of transition through different phases or ways of being or something. What, what spoke to me about spiral dynamics was not the specifics of how they laid it out, but the framework that allows fluidity based on your personality as a person and then the context in which you find yourself. And that how you as the same person, if your contexts change, then your growth or development or whatever word we want to use within that is going to change the way that you view the world and the way that you make decisions. So like, for instance, and I, th- and I think that this speaks a lot to uh privileged circumstance in life and how that gives you the space to come up with the stages and formulas in the first place to begin to universalize to everyone else. And I think that one of the examples that is, you know, as an extreme example, but strikes out is that right now, the way that we make decisions in the midst of the pandemic is very different from the way that we made decisions back in January. You know, some of the same rhetoric exists in terms of uh, when we talk about the divide in our country and all that kind of stuff. But now that we're in a little, there's, there's less freedom to move like literally (laughs) outside of our house, then it's affecting the way our priorities are right. So now my priority through the day is, being careful about going to the store, planning something that I took for granted before. And all of those surrounding restrictions are going to affect 
my interaction and consciousness in the way that the world goes. And that the longer those things, the more habit, the more the habit that's going to be. So what appealed to me for spiral dynamics was not the specifics of what happens when your situation, but just the idea that you can, you can move in and out of these things and there's nothing static. That's always what I've had. And it's to a certain degree, what I appreciate about the Enneagram on an individual level is that there's there's motion in there, right? Like with the idea of a wing and, you know, it takes into account how you're feeling and when you're in a, a good place or a not so good place. So I appreciate those models that give you flexibility because that's the world we live in. And it, and it helps me, it helped me at least in the beginning stages of my deconstruction and really trying to rebuild something was that it, I think in the beginning I was looking for a new model. I was looking for a new truth to hold on to. And this gave me the freedom to be like, eh, I don't need to. Like I I I I I can leave that part behind and have a lot more freedom to explore and move forward because I'm not trying to figure out the formula. And that's how my personal brain is wired. Like I like to look at that because I feel like in a lot of ways I'm story driven. I'm looking for arcs and structure and all these kind of things in in everyday life. And I think that there's an advantage to that, but I also think it can be detrimental as well. So our growth, our, our models for what growth means for us are at least somewhat context dependent is, is like what I'm hearing. Right. It matters I, where you're at and what your environment is. Right. If I, maybe if I was going to put it more succinctly, it would be it eliminates a grand goal and allows me to be fine with micro goals like for this day, for this season of my life. And knowing that there's not an end, it just is. Mm hmm. It might even take goals out of the conversation, right? which I think is helpful, especially in the spiritual walk, because we're, you know, if we're used to, if we've been, if we've been programmed to having an ideal in mind and we're constantly measuring ourselves against that ideal, we don't often question the ideal, which is probably where the questioning should begin. We instead question whether or not we are emulating that or reaching toward it in right or wrong ways. And so then a step back, which, you know, it, like regression, then becomes shame and guilt and judgment and self-loathing and all kinds of things that are actually counterproductive for the spiritual path. Oh, my heart spiritual needs to hear growth. that again. <laughs> I need to hear that again. Uh, right. And I think counterproductive. And I think that yes. the term goal is probably problematic. Maybe the a better word is like my current drive. Uh, yeah. Motivation, whatever that, that thing that's pushing me forward, uh, where the goal is the tangible part of it, but the drive is the intangible. Why am I doing what I'm doing right now? Yeah, I, you know, I'm reading this book for my my doctoral program that I'm super excited about and open and relational theology. And um, this theorist, it's Hartshorn, actually, he, he says God should, should be able, like, the way we think about God should be in relation to what we consider worship worthy or worshipful. So I think that's like a, you know, and, and then like, if we start from there, then we can start to think about what God's characteristics might or might not be. But I think that's a really interesting question, especially in thinking about stages of growth and spiritual development is like in this moment, like how would you answer that question? Like what is worshipful? And and then it, it likely it's going to be a very different answer based on the context in which we're moving in the moment, even like in two hours, it might feel like a different answer. So I really like what you're saying, Jeff, about that spiral dynamics. I mean, the key word is dynamics, right? Like it's, there ha there's flux. And instead of judging it as like step forward, step back, even the spiral idea, depending on how you draw your spiral can be seen as like step forward, step back, or, or like a descent, ascent or something, you know? And I mean, just to let go of all of that and just live in dynamics, just, just dynamics. Maybe that's helpful. I, I could see how that'd be helpful for a lot of people. Um, one thing that's really helpful for me is using concrete like terms and yeah. spaces because there's some part of my personality and I don't think it's just what was formed in my community, although that's undeniably a part of it, that relaxes a little bit. When I know I'm in 
a certain stage or when I'm just going through something to know that, Hey, this is just part of the process and you don't have to get to the end or you don't have to get to the next stage or you don't have to like, you know, deal with this right now. This is something that is you're growing toward or that you're, you're moving toward and that it can't be rushed. I think like, and and that's one of the questions I have is can growth be rushed or is it something that takes time? You know, I, I saw, I saw this kind of language used in, to make it really concrete. Somebody was really upset at the worship atmosphere in a church that uh, Jeff and I were, I think I was going to your church, Jeff, at one point, and there was this young adult who was like, I look around and I judge people who are worshiping. Like, it makes me angry for all these reasons. They had great reasons. They were very rightfully angry. And I think a lot of people who come through this process, the you know, in our listeners, they probably reached a place like that too, where it just pisses them off to watch people worshiping sometimes from the groups that they came from. Cause you know, it's a, it's a very vulnerable experience and it's being uh, manipulated sometimes and things like that. And, or people are hypocrites, you know, they're worshiping God, but they're hating their neighbor and they're trying to work through their hatred or their animosity. And, and they were talking to Jeff over dinner. And I remember Jeff telling them like, you just have to wait. Like you will get through that eventually, but it's kind of like puberty. You can't rush it. You know, and I remember that moment being really powerful for that person he was talking to and for me to realize that there are sometimes things you have to just wait through and you can't get to the 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 resolution without the growth, without the the time it takes to get there. So um, for me, it, it's helpful to use staging language. And I and love the idea of it being context dependent too. you know, what's worshipful for an infant might not be worshipful for me. <laughs> you know, yeah. like utter, like, like, you know, if you're a baby, uh, it's all about utter dependence, complete dependence, no self-differentiation, right? Like unself-consciousness, like that's, that's what, that's what it means to be a baby. But, and that's worshipful in that moment. But for me, those things would probably be bad if I wasn't conscious of myself and the way I was affecting other people. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I think, Alan, the concrete language can be really helpful at different, especially at different times. You know, Eric Erickson, developmental uh, psycho uh, psychologist who came up with the psychosocial stages of development, he talks about each stage involving conflict. And I think that's that that can be useful, too. Like there, there's no um, settled path that really there are sort of these, uh, you know, he frames it in a, uh, like almost a dialectical sort of way where, mm -hmm. where it's like um, in adolescence, it's identity versus confusion. And that's the inner conflict that the, that the, during that stage of development has to be worked out in order to then be able to grow or move into the next stage of development. That's where the time that it takes, the resources that it takes, the mental energy, the space that it takes to sort of work through conflict that arises, you know, might be really useful for people to know that in, in a way, I mean, some people talk about it as almost a developmental depression, like, mm. it, you know, that, that it's natural and normal to sort of sink into a space of feeling you know, a lot disconnected, a lack of a lot of confusion, um, not able to put language to things that you think, you know, maybe in your body or in your heart, because you're working on something internally that hasn't, it's, it, it hasn't completely, um, integrated yet. And that's all, that's, that's part of the process. That's, that's yes. normal. That's natural. That's actually something to be celebrated because it mo means that you're moving. Yes. You're, you're moving. You're not staying in the same place. And, and maybe that's one way to look at it. It's not growth. It's movement, right? It, it's not a goal we're headed to, but it's movement. It's, it's a, it's a shift. And yeah. each shift we make broadens us. Because if, if, if one stage is demonized, then you're missing out on the point. I, I think, I think I'm getting what you're saying. Like it's not growth, it's movement. Like if, if there's, yeah, to say that someone's in one stage that that's bad is to say that that stage is bad. 
And right. like, that's, and that, that's not the point. It may be necessary. Right. <laughs> so necessary. it can't be bad if and it's like, necessary. That's beautiful. And I think that allows people to let go of shame and let go of so much mental anguish over being in those places um, at different points. And, you know, it, it's easy to talk the game, but to be honest, when I'm in the dark night of the soul, nothing consoles me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's just no, like no podcast I listen to. that tells me, Hey, let go of shame, embrace it, trust the process. Those things help but really they don't help. I mean, there's, there's nothing you can really do when you're in those places of like developmental depression, almost like you're talking about. But you can read people who have also been in it. That's, yes, a, you know, absolutely. like some of the, the, like yeah. St. John of the cross and St. Right. Teresa of Avila and others who you're like, okay, at least there's, I have a compadre in this moment. Yeah. Um, I think those are the moments where concrete language is important and helpful because it's not something that was given to us. It's something that we discovered. And I think that that's the the big portion of it. And naturally, when we discover something, we want to share it. And then we kind of perpetuate it a little bit by then, you know, giving it to someone else, but not acknowledging that, whoa, this is something that can't be given. It has to be discovered. Yes. Yes. It- so one thing that helped for me in my development of moving through my own spirituality that the concrete developmental stuff that helped me uh was written by and i think he's drawing on a lot of different things but sam keen this book uh the passionate life and just a trigger warning for anyone who's going to read the passionate life there's sex in it and all kinds of stuff and and philosophy and theology and process theology and all kinds of stuff that have informed this book so a little warning to you if you're going to read it but it was written in the 90s i believe and he talked about how Um, In our kind of social environment, we really have three stages of development that we've recognized as a society. There's childhood, adolescence, and adult. And the goal, the stated goal of like most of American society is to get people to be successful adults, right? Like we graduate them from high school, we train them, we help them be good, good citizens. And he talks about these stages in terms, I liked conflict, but he uses it in terms of dependence, so like there's uh, the, the child is um, dependent and like, just utterly dependent and not really self-conscious and uh, the rebel temperament or like the adolescent temp- temp- temperament is the counter dependence. Like you're learning to be like against this dependence, right? Like you're lashing out against your parents or whatever. And um, it's self-conscious. And then the adult personality where we kind of terminate as a society for the most part, he actually labels it codependent. It's this informing of our religious mythos, our societal mythos, like being a good adult is having the white picket fence, like all these things that are being expected of us and to, to really embrace that. And we're, we're informed by that kind of group consciousness. But for him, there's two steps that come after that that I found really, really helpful. And after the adult, he, he labels it the outlaw, someone who is uh, independent someone who chooses to step out of the mythos of what they've grown up with and what they've been given in their family or their religious structure or their society. And um, they're like self-witnessing, you know, you're watching yourself, like you're, you're stepping out into this new territory. And I think, you know, some, some of American culture uh, really appreciates the outlaw, right? Like we kind of like the old West, like, you know, there's some sort of, especially when it comes to our businesses and our corporations, the outlaw is a really powerful story that we tell ourselves. They're very independent, you know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, do what you're going to do. But for him beyond that, um, in his articulation of development, the, the next step beyond that, and it's not something you just get to, it's something you kind of go back and forth through these different um, stages is the lover. And that's someone that's interdependent and you're self transcending and you have like a, a wider consciousness around, I need to stop saying wider. It sounds like whiter and I, <laughs> I well, keep saying wider. Okay. You say wider that though, world. Alan, you say that like, it's funny that you bring that up because I'm thinking like America values the outlaw when they're white. For, yes. Thank you. That is, that's yes, absolutely. I mean, so the, there are the different modes like been through. I think a lot because I think that that's true. And I think that that's something I adopted also growing up, especially as a Gen X grunge re- rebel kind of stuff with no, at least at that moment in time, no awareness that this is not a value that is uh, allowed to be 
expressed in certain communities and among certain people and how we, we tend to put a monolith on American culture for sure. Definitely. That's well said. I, I honestly haven't thought about that too hard in terms of developmental theory. That's interesting. Like one thing that um, guards the boundary between the adult that is codependent um, on like that is just informed by group consciousness and the outlaw is self knowledge and self love. Once you embrace self knowledge and self love, it kind of takes you out of the, the mythos you grew up with and into this more self embracing kind of space. And I think you're right. I think in our society for some people, we elevate their, their outlaw status whether it's corporations or white people or something else. And then for other people, we demonize it like, Oh, don't be prideful or self-loving or whatever, you know, and there's, or, this... or an actual outlaw <laughs> or an actual outlaw. Yeah. I mean, yeah. look what's happening right now. You go to another County, another state and defend a gas station, but then you also try to defend yourself against the cops. And the outcome is very different depending upon the color. Of your yeah. Skin. And, and you can be white and you can take over a federal, go- a federal building for, like, I don't forget how long they were there, but cattle ranchers took over one and didn't get prosecuted. You know, there, there's, there is a different level of respect for that, for people's process in our, in our mm-hmm. society. I think that's, that's well said. And I, I'm, so I'm, I think a lot of people that we've, that we talk with that are a part of our community, they're really stepping from the adult to the the outlaw in some respects, you know, like you've grown up with church, you've grown up with your religion, you've, you've grown up with what you've been told was a good way to do it. And you tried to do that. And you've come to a place where you're recognizing, okay, self-knowledge and self-love is not a bad thing. And I'm embracing that. And it's taking me out of the mythos that I grew up with that, that kind of informed me. But I appreciate that there's something beyond that, you know, that reintegration and then realizing Mm -hmm. like we are interdependent and we can have this like transcendent ex- experience and consciousness of our world, but it's not something you just reach and you stay there. Right. Like I think it's, you're, you're going back and forth between these things, but I found it to be pretty helpful. Yeah. And I, I think it, it I think one reason why it's helpful is because um, I, I think movement it often is a passage through some darkness of some kind. Otherwise, you're adopting somebody else's movement and not your own, which, Mm -hmm. you know, Jeff was kind of talking about, too, like finding discovering one's own language for things, making it concrete to oneself in relationship, of course, to everyone else um, is very different than reading a book and then saying, "Okay, now I've now I got it. I think that's super helpful, Alan, that framing that you provided in those stages. And I, my guess is that almost every model there's overlap because even though we don't say, even though I would say we want to caution against any of this being universal, there's something about the human spirit. That's the human spirit. And um, we'll use different language for it for sure. And it will, the experience of it is different, um, but there's something about movement in our understandings and awarenesses and consciousness that seems to, uh, to be almost transcendent. That's what I appreciate about Sam Keen in particular is he draws in lots of history, like a lot of history from different cultures, from from different times and really has like a unique reflection on like where we were at as a society. And one other thing he talks about is the different wounds in the different stages, like, Mm -hmm he uses the term perversity in one place. And that's just like a turning away from what you're actually trying to do, like a, a misshapen. So like, there's this like, you know, different wounds you have in the culture and that the outlaw, there is something beautiful about it and necessary and good and, and something that is beneficial spiritually, but it can also be twisted, right? Like we can, we can say, I'm going to determine myself and we can destroy the planet. We can destroy everything because that is just a part of what I want to do. And that's how I identify. So I think that there is, at different stages or, or, uh, adulthood, like a twisted adulthood is like normalcy quote unquote, this is just the way it is. And this is what's normal. There's a powerful story there that hurts people that hurts like everyone around us and it cannot actually hurt us as well. And at the same time, there's a good thing about that. We do have to have communities that kind of inform us. And you know, one thing I love about, uh, uh, process theologians, like, uh, what was that book we read on the mystery? 
Is that yeah, Catherine, Catherine Keller? Catherine Keller. So he writes like she does. And he's writing in the 90s with that little dash in between all the words. Mm-hmm. Like they'll do prefixes and things like that. Like in form. The idea that we are informed is that we have been formed by our communities. And like there's there's a necessity to that. There's a necessity to uh, to, to giving us something kind of solid that that we would call a- adulthood. But the but the perversity is like saying this is just the way it is for everybody, or just this is just the way that it has to be, or the way that it is um, by nature. And so, I like I like thinking through where I might be at any given moment, what my challenges might be, what um, what the benefits, what the the cha- the difficulties could be. And I think for people who are on a journey, that stuff feels like a, a lifeline, you know, knowing that you're not going to be there forever that there is life beyond this current stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another a model that I'm going to throw out there that was has been very influential to me is Jim Marion. He uses a lot of Ken Wilber's philosophy. And he wrote a book called The Death of the Mythic God, meaning most of us, most adults in the United States are in this mythic stage of consciousness mm-hmm. And what happens, and each of these stages also has a, you know, like a supreme reality that we relate to, depending on which stage we're in and what happens when the mythic God dies, um, then it tends to cause like a huge amount of just inner chaos and worldview chaos. Um, And he goes through, he has seven different levels of consciousness that he talks about that are part of the spiritual path. And so I commend that to anyone who's interested in checking it out. Jim Marion, he's written several books, all of which have been helpful. He relies on like Ken Wilber and also the mystic mystics themselves and what they say about their processes. I love that. And I can't wait to hear more from like, I'm going to look in the show notes to see exactly which books and look them up. But I think even people who are not necessarily religious or identify that way can identify with the death of the mythos, like the, the American myth or the, the myth that they had about our society for a lot of people that's crumbling right now, you know, American exceptionalism, all these things that kind of made them who they are when that dies, there's so much work left to do or begin the sky dot the sky god falls Mm -hmm. and uh the sky god can also be country (laughs) for sure well yes absolutely (laughs) well you know as as we're talking about this i'm just i'm trying to think in terms of how how i've experienced this language throughout my life and when we talk about consciousness there there tends to be an individualistic application to that kind of language. And, you know, we're talking about different societal things that are happening and going on and how we use very different language for culture and systems and country and all that kind of stuff and how we've done such work to compartmentalize those two. And thinking about the archetype of the rebel, Really, these archetypes and these internal processes, they seem to be just reflections of the context that we find ourselves in. So reflections of whatever our either, obviously it's layered, but our family, our immediate community, our our country, however we want to do that. And they seem to be more reflection of the values that we've been given and an, an, an external example of how we're struggling through those values to find where our place is amidst those values. And we, we look at the rebel, you know, why do we idolize that in our particular context? It seems that it's more that maybe one of the values that it's reflecting or two of the values that are conflicting within that reflection are our power and justice and how closely those two things are I don't like using the term slippery slope, but they seem to be so connected and and it's easy to step from one side to the other in a pursuit for justice to then shift into a pursuit of power and how when we're talking about consciousness and self-reflection and all that kind of stuff, we tend to leave out the surrounding things, right? It becomes all internal work in the way that we talk about it, at least, or the language that we use as opposed to, you know, balancing psychological theory with, uh, you know, sociological theory and how do all these things come together? Because a lot of what we're presented is very 
or at least academia, very one-sided, coming from a very specific context. I don't know. I don't know what all that means. I'm just out. I'm just outward processing kind of this conversation that we're having, and how stark it is to me that we've made that delineation. I, I would say any developmental theory worth anything um, also relates somehow to the broader, like the collective developmental process as well as the individual developmental process. I think that's so important, Jeff, because there's no way, you know, institutions, cultures, worldviews, they're all based on where a collective is in a given moment. And the collective is made up of individuals for sure. But it, you know, like what we think is education what we call education is going to be based on our particular stage. If we want to use the word stage collectively of, of development. And we know from studying history that there is movement there. And maybe some of us might call it movement towards where we want to end up. And some might call it like regression or devolution (laughs) towards a place we no longer want to be. And that's where the spiral dynamics theory can be really useful because we can see that, you know, there's a, there's tension, there's conflict in every, in every stage of movement or every like breakthrough, I guess, to the next thing, whatever that's going to be. And we're in the middle of that right now. The tension is thick. And so like even the term outlaw, well, whose side depends on whose side you're on as to, you know, who the outlaws are. If you look collectively, I, I think honestly, if I, if I had to put this map, this somewhere where we're at as a society from my vantage point, I would say the struggle is between like the rebel adolescent temperament and the adult uh, temperament, those two stages. It feels like there is this really big pull to be like counter dependent, right? Like we don't want to be dependent on any other country. You want to kind of do like, but we talked before Jeff, I think you and I about America being more in this adolescent stage of development as far as countries go from like a, a historical stage. point of view in terms of its, the length of its existence. In yeah. His, yeah. And, and I think there's this pull toward we're, we're not even ready to be in the rebel, like the, the, the outlaw, the outlaw is something beyond adulthood where you start to drop your masks and stuff and really like deal with who you are. I feel like America hasn't gotten to that place. We're still struggling to be an adult and move out of adolescence. We're like, extremely counter dependent and um, very violent and very, and, and some of those things like, you know, there's virtues that, that go along with that. Like he talks about um, Sam Keen in this system talks about, uh, you know, the ability to doubt and criticize establish lin- uh, limits and boundaries and say, no express outrage and anger and aggression. Um, some of those things are healthy for adolescents to be able to do. And our society is like, it's like there, like we are there, we've been there for a while. And there's this push to, you know, responsibility and loyalty and discipline and all those things that we talk about with adulthood. We haven't even begun as a society to kind of transcend adulthood toward this, um, you know, outlaw ideal. And then to be a lover, to be interdependent with the rest of the world. Like we've got a long way to go uh, as a culture. So I, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm frustrated that we're, we're so slow on the, the process. And um, maybe that's a bad thing to be frustrated with people when they're in different stages, but are we slow or are we sporadic? Like, would we be saying the same thing in the midst of Obama's administration? Like if we're going to use that, like the way that our, the, our collective consciousness as Americans run, it's largely dependent upon the leaders that are in front of us, right? And how, what we're going to express and how we're going to express it depending upon the group that we're coming with. Like, clearly we have an adolescent <laughs> representing us in a lot of different ways. Right. And how that sh- – how like – now, granted, like real power, Congress, like in terms of like things that actually get done. But I think that there's that other layer that most people don't talk about – or at least pinpoint exactly, but then there's that 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 symbolic layer of this is this is informing the way that we're uh, at least on the surface thinking about the world around us, and I think a leader is a powerful drive of that. I, I that's where I think the struggle comes in. I think there is a struggle to pull us into adulthood 
Like we're struggling to step into that as a society. And I think Obama would represent some of those things to me, at least from well, my perspective. I think uh, so. You just said it. And that, I think that pinpointed for me what my problem is, is this using the model of adulthood. Right. Because even within that framework, we're looking at ourselves as a society and country that we're going to reach adulthood. And then that comes with it certain ideas of what maturity and what growth is. And that if we that's what you know, when we talk about where our country is now, a lot of people say, well, we've gone we've gone backward. Right. We we so it, it puts us in this context of, I don't know, cultural shame. I don't know if that's the right thing to do is because we're not reaching this certain idea of what adulthood is. Because when we use the word adulthood, we're talking about a progression forward that we can't come back from. Yeah, I, I'm not in, I'm not setting out to shame anyone. I'm I'm more like I think it's helpful to understand the transitions that we're going through. And I think when you look at other countries, they've made transitions that have been very different than ours. And I think that when you look at the world stage, it's easy to see some of those things. And so knowing like where that maybe conflict is a good way to say it, but knowing that we're like, we're in this, we're in this phase as a country, like let's own it, you know, like let's, let's step out from, from this way of thinking into this way of thinking. It's something that's just happening and shifting and there's conflict involved in it. And knowing that that's not where we're going to end up as a country. There's a land beyond where we're at now that we can actually get to, to me, that's exciting and wonderful. You know, like, but, that, but that's the thing. Is there there, there that, is a land beyond that we will get to. But when we say that, when the way that you're saying it, there's an underlying insinuation that it's better, that there's hope. And it I, is, it is better though. In my turn, to, to me, like those transitions are better because right now, like our military is putting a gun to the head of the whole world. Like it, you know, whether you shoot a gun or not, you've used it. If you walk into a bank and you wave it around. Right now, our military is literally holding a gun to the head of the entire world. Right. But what and if I that next movement like... is them pulling the trigger? You know what I'm <laughs> saying? Like, it's it's not necessarily. Well, well, okay. So the, the next movement of adulthood is responsibility, like taking responsibility for yourself, like stepping onto the world stage and being like, okay, this is what it means to be a country. Right. Not and the I... way we've been before, but like, this is a better in, information of what it means to be a global. Right. And I'm not, I'm not critiquing that idea, but I'm critiquing what we've been critiquing this whole time is the language that we use for these movements in terms of growth and evolution and stepping forward, as opposed to just like what, what Bonnie has proposed, which I love and it's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. Just the idea of movement, because the way that you're describing movement, you're using growth language. I, I think what we have to consider is that all of our lives are finite right. and we have to embrace finitude as part of this conversation. Yeah. And our experience between now and the end of our lives, we will interpret it how we interpret it. It'll be based on, you know, um, what we see in the streets around us and out our windows. And um, we will make our judgments and values um, based on that. However, collectively speaking, uh, movement is often much slower than it is for the individual, right? Yeah. And it probably... Um, if we want to use words like forward and backwards, it probably moves forwards and backwards many times before it actually moves. Mm. And I think this is why there's a lot of criticism of developmental theory is because we quickly then like extrapolate it into this wide sense of like now we can we can kind of we can create the formula, we can write the formula down and then we can expect it out of the world, out of ourselves, out of our neighbors, and out of the world. And that's probably just not true or fair. And, and we have to sit in it long enough to actually have it be complete, to have the movement actually be movement instead of just kind of like a, a toe in the water. And then, you know, and a, a, a lot of times we don't have patience for that. And it could be that our models of developmental process and developmental stages is what prevents us from having patience. So this feels like a Gen X millennial conversation now. Could be. Because like my generation <laughs> is coming to grips with in childhood, knowing that the world is going to die. Like that's what I was raised on. I was yeah. raised on knowing for a fact that the world is going to die and we've killed it. And it's like, yeah, we can wait to elevate our consciousness till we're all dead. Till the world does something else with with what nature has done for billions of years, but I feel like this this new generations these new generations too, and they're embracing this like 
there's this existential crisis of if we do not grow as a society, Mm -hmm. we won't make it. (laughs) And so there's a level of expediency that I don't Mm -hmm. think has been. And yeah, like we can feel shame for where we've been. That's fine. If people want to hear shame from what we're talking about, that's okay. Like they can, they can stick there. I don't think it's helpful. I don't think shame's helpful, but we're not trying to shame people. We're just like, this is no longer relevant. Like counter dependence and codependence are, are going to kill all of us. Like the, the, uh, the adulthood of the liberal, you know, majority or whatever, the, the, the adulthood that they're asking for is still going to kill us. We have to get to a point where we're independent, interdependent as a globe, if we're going to solve these things that could end all of us. So I think when I think in terms of like systems growth, it is good and bad. It is life and not life. It is mass death and, and, uh, flourishing and becoming the potential of what we could be. And, and that's where Robert Keegan's developmental theory, I think is really important because he writes it, that we're in over our heads. And and that's, I mean, I think um, we have prophets who are like seers who mm-hmm. are, you know, maybe have been either gifted or have done this work, or I don't know, somehow they're endowed with this ability to see things beyond what the mass folks can see what, what the, the collective folks can see. And they call us into this like quicker movement towards different levels of consciousness that will hopefully contribute to co-flourishing because you're right there, but the finitude is always in the middle of it. And, you know, we can hope that like what has happened to the individual where now you're learning algebra in like fifth grade, Whereas, you know, how long did it take the mathematicians of ancient times to be able to come up with algebra? Mm -hmm. We can hope that perhaps that will also be true of us collectively as we move into new forms of relating to the world and to one another, that we will be able to do it sooner and sooner and sooner to be able to catch up with the technology that frankly has outpaced us tremendously. The Second Amendment was never written with the the um, weapons that we that our technology has has enabled. It was never written with that in mind, with those weapons in mind. And nobody really wants to talk about that, but it's that's a fact. And um, and so if our consciousness doesn't keep pace with the technology that we continue to advance, then how are we going to save ourselves in the world? That, that is the question for our time. I came into this conversation thinking that we could not rush our, our growth. And now I like hearing you talk about it. Like now I feel like we have to, <laughs> like, how do you, you know, how do we, our, 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 maybe not our personal, but our uh, societal growth. How do you, how do you put a rush on things when, when it's needed to survive? And then survival. How important is that? Is that the goal? Yeah. I think that's another, and I think that perhaps as we move into different, as we move consciously, it, it might, our ideas about that might change. But that's right. the paradox, I, I, right? Is that the, the circumstances dictate our consciousness. So if we are in survival mode, how in the midst of a world where we need to survive, do we transcend that particular context to be able to think in such a way To do that. And I think that that's part of the problem is that you do have those thinkers, prophets, whatever we want to call them, that are able to do that. But then the problem is it gets lost in translation. And that's where language becomes super important is that we we understand we have this collective movement that we need to make together. But then we try to use a collective language to communicate that instead of recognizing that different people speak different languages. And it takes a lot to be able to separate yourself from that context. And and that's where that that conflict of society and individual come, you know, crashing together and paralyze us. I I think I know what moves though. Like I've heard spiritual teachers talk about the things that propel us past that like paralyzation or or help us rush that growth process. And I've heard people say it either takes great love or great suffering. And those are the only two things that are gateways for us to come into new types of consciousness. And I don't want to let go of the great love. (laughs) Like it could be that we just have to suffer greatly like we are now. And for some communities, 
that's all that, that that's what they know is great suffering. And it's their consciousness is different than mine because they've gone through that. And I think us as a society or as a planet and a species, I can see that great suffering might teach us something, but I have not let out hope that like love could motivate us. A great love might pull us into a, a different type of consciousness. And that's something that I gravitate toward. Yeah. And then the, the, I think I, I do too, Alan, I'm with you on that. I do wonder though, how we get to a place of great love and what, what it takes to get there and whether or not we're willing to put our, our lives on the line in the way that's necessary, maybe to actually embody that great. That love. sounds so Jesus-y. I love it. Does. It. I was actually trying to, <laughs> trying to bridge back to the, the, you know, uh, well, this is a progressive Christian podcast. Yes, it is. So, um, so oh, yeah, we wonderful. have, a, we have an ancient myth about yeah. movement, right? And, Definitely. But that's, um, that's, this is where, this is where language becomes important because we all have different definitions of what love is. What is that great love? For some people, they are looking at Trump as a great love because love is conformity. Love is control. Love is making sure that everyone's quote unquote safe. And I think that you're right, Alan. I agree with everything that you're saying, but I, we know our definition of what we mean when we say that. And Jesus said it's, you know, the willingness to lay your life down for your friend. And and that's that not a willingness to kill someone else for your friend, a willingness to to die for your friend. There's a there's a there's a universe of difference between those. Two I things. agree with you, but not everyone does. Like that kid who went to that gas station to def- or to defend that piece of property with his gun, he was doing exactly what you said. He was laying down his life for. No, he was laying down other people's lives. I mean, walking well, in there. That's and- what he was doing. But w- if you asked him that, would was would that be what he you're said? Right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That that narrative gets used in service of of nationalism and violence right. all the time. So I'm wondering if we're just like, because our society is, and I think we've talked about this in the very beginning of the conversation is that when we, when we talk about growth in our community or in, in America, at least what our economic systems represent, they represent excess and like literal growth. And are, are we too big to even manage that many narratives to have a collective at all? I, I think that, so the, correct me if I'm wrong, that place that that person came from, like the vigilante idea that they went to the gas station to protect it from the people who were protesting murder. I think that comes from a limited consciousness that comes from uh, like a real American consciousness that was informed in, in our lives pretty early. It's not from a global consciousness. It's not from a species wide consciousness. It's not from like a, an understanding the complexities of there are people being murdered in the streets. And so I'm going to identify with them and, and know like that it's a very limited perspective from my mind. It comes from wanting to be good in, yes, in the, in the exactly. community's eyes. Right. Rather and, than love. Well, it, it, but that's being good and being loving. And those when are you're, two different things though. This desire to, to be you good and the desire to be loving, but, but not to them who will, yeah, no, to them, they would say that they want to be right more than they want to be loving. And they, they say that all the time and all the messaging that they speak, they want to be on the right side. They want to defend their like more than they want to be loving. But That's if you just, push them, they would also say that they're, they're one and the same. Right. Ultimately. I think I think uh, we're in this really difficult, challenging time. And yeah. I think that we have tools at our disposal that we're just not capable of using well. Whether, you know, and I, and I, I don't, I'm not saying we should go back and not have them anymore. I think that they can be super useful <laughs> if, if we were able to um, move into a different way of seeing the world and seeing each other. But it's concerning. And I do think that survival, when we use survival language, which I totally get. And I mean, I, and I hear you, Alan, about the world, whether or not the world is going to be here. I, I'm not sure that the, I think that human beings may not be here sometime. And I, I think that if there is a time when humans are no longer on the planet, that uh, the planet will perhaps be able to renew and recharge and a new trajectory of evolution burst forth. And I think making peace with that is unfortunately part of, part of our, what it means to be interdependent. Yes. And I hate to say that. I mean, and I'm saying this as yes, right. Gen Xer who like hid <laughs> under the desk because 
nuclear bombs were going to drop. Right. And that was part of my childhood's reality was any moment the Russians could drop bombs on us and your desk is going to save you. Like we, none of us, <laughs> none of us in sixth grade or fifth grade or fourth grade believed that. Shit. <laughs> so <laughs> we lived with ex- existential. I think, I think right. we have, I think that's one thing that we can all connect on. Yeah. Like we definitely, don't need definitely. to be, you know, separate on that. And and it's a great suffering for us it's to be in the great position suffering. where we can kill everybody. Yeah. Right. Whether it's nuclear war or environmental degradation. And like, that's, that's the, to me, those are both uh, uh, paths to that, that higher consciousness or whatever. And now they exist. They coexist. Those right. two paths of extinction but, coexist. Well, yeah. no, I'm thinking of two paths of, of development, like the via negativa and the via positiva. Like you're saying, imagine a world where human beings have gone extinct. I actually think that's a good spiritual practice to sit and be like, one day I won't be here. One day everyone I know and love won't be here. Like, you know, to, to, to think about the universe is bigger than just us. That brings us into the interdependent consciousness, just like you said, Bonnie. Um, but there's, but like, I'll hold that in one hand and I'll hold the via positive in the other. I see the face Absolutely. of God when I look at a child, when I look at another person, when I look at my enemy. And so melding those things together is what creates that creativity for us to be able to do justice in this exact moment. And like, I, I, the, the via positiva is one that I'm really holding on to is I think most of us are letting that go right now, this year in 2020, we're like, man, things are tough. People are divided. The world is like, and, and I think there's a lot of energy for the, the, the younger people who are stepping into all of this, like they're, they've got that via positivity to the, to the max, like via positiva, they, they celebrate diversity and they celebrate like this interconnectedness and they're you know, very intense against these, uh, against nuclear pro- proliferation and economic or uh, ecological devastation. And so, and I see people who are older, older in my congregation and in my circles who celebrate that. They're like, well, we've been waiting for this, you know, we've been waiting for this consciousness to, to lift up. So anyway, I just want to say, yes, I'm with you in that. And it's kind of like a both and thing for it has for to be, it doesn't, it gives you the strength to stay in the fight. I think mm. when you realize that survival isn't like personal survival, isn't the ultimate goal necessarily. And that, you know, the myth, the Christian myth, it does um, indicate that going through letting go of survival, there's some kind of deeper magic that, that yes. then is on the other side that maybe we'll never see, but we get to still be a part of by staying in the fight. So, yeah, I, I think that they're both, they have to both be held together. I'm not saying give up. I'm saying like right. fight even harder because um, you can let go of perhaps some of that survival mm-hmm. being the goal. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Thank you both for <laughs> talking about this. This is your a great, <laughs> great conversation, Alan. Thank you for yeah, it feels, it. it. feels pretty timely, I guess. It does. <laughs> It absolutely does. And we would absolutely love to know what you think. You can add your voice to this particular conversation by going to the show notes. Also there, you'll find relevant links and a complete list of other ways to like, follow, and contact the show. So on the other side of the music, we are going to be playing a brand new segment called Classy or Trashy. All right, so we are on the other side of the music, and we are going to be trying a new segment invented by our very own Alan called Classy or Trashy. And how this is going to work is each of us is going to present a thought that goes along the lines of what is considered classy for blank, but trashy for blank. And then each of the other two hosts have to give their answer. And of course, we have to pick a winner. So the person presenting the idea will get to pick which one that they like the best and further disconnect our relationships with one another through competition. So <laughs> <laughs> well, and where this came from was there was a tweet that said, what's classy for rich people, but trashy for poor people. And one of the answers was taking money from the government or something. And which is, which mm. is pretty funny. There was lots yeah. of people answering kind of breaking down that binary right. for us. So what we're hoping this segment will do is 
highlight the ridiculousness of the things that we put out there and things that use to divide us and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think that's the heart of what we're trying to get to here. Not more division. Right. <laughs> just, just highlight the ridiculousness of the same thing. All can, right. We're trying to actually figure out what's classy and what's trashy. There we go. Okay. That's right. So the yeah. world knows. For all of us, for everybody, everywhere, <laughs> yeah. for all contexts. That's the hope. But if it, you know, <laughs> who knows with these segments. So, so Alan, since this was your your baby, so to speak, present us with your first your first idea. Okay. I can't help, help but go with this one. What is classy for Christians and trashy for everybody else for the world quote unquote mm. praise music <laughs> yeah i can see that <laughs> it's true that that reminds me i spent a lot of time on tiktok lately just very curious about the platform. I want to see kind of where these, these trends are beginning to develop. So for probably, probably the past year. Um, and <laughs> I just saw some video uh, with uh, a woman who, from what I gather from the comments and various other videos that I've seen is not well liked among <laughs> the, the community of TikTok and YouTube or whatever, but she <laughs> had this particular video where the music it's, oh man, which it's one of those really sexual Jesus songs. I think it's come Lord Jesus come or something like that. Like it's one of these songs that's playing and she's provocatively <laughs> dancing in her underwear to this song. And then you read the comments and it was just these, everyone, like it, it brought everyone together because everyone was like, the Christians were like, how dare you do that to the name of Jesus? And there was a couple of people that said, I'm atheist and I'm offended by this. <laughs> it was just this very interesting anyway i don't know why that made me think of that but that's that's there so your answer is saying come lord jesus come is classy for christians and trashy for everybody else. no 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 i'm i'm uh, <laughs> oh, okay i'm like he was <laughs> adding context to my answer right. which is oh, okay. exactly well exactly what i was thinking of Very nice. <laughs> I, i'm gonna go with uh large gold jewelry like the not even not just jewelry but just gold let's say gold like that 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 idea oh of my like God. wait you're saying it's classy <laughs> for certain types of christians and trashy for everyone else that is interesting right huh what about those gems in flashing the crowns money. that we're supposed to get <laughs> flashing your money <laughs> flexing <laughs> right there we go there we go flexing is classy for the televangelist and Oh, that's funny. They're trashy for everybody else. Right. I see. I can see that. <laughs> Makes total sense that's to me. That's pretty good. I think for the for the winner, I think I'll go with uh, worship music. There's just something about it. I think the cadence of it, you know, like you can tell when something's worship music the second you've listened to it within like 10, mm -hmm. within like two seconds. And for mm -hmm. some reason, there's just something about it that like, remember in the, you know, when I was um, in more, uh, traditionally evangelical spaces there was so much cred that that built up for you you know so much and then in the rest of society it's like not to speak ill of country music but the country music of <laughs> so here we go well and also like anyway. that particular type of music it's it's uh and when i think praise music i'm thinking like you know, the, the white praise music. So I want yes. to make yeah. that clear. For yeah. real, the, that's the, a good distinction. That because sort of it, it's, mega church model of, you know, the band and the singers and yeah. In in Austin Channing Brown's book, uh, we, we interviewed uh, Austin like a long time ago. I'm still here. Uh, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. She talks about the difference between those types of music, um, the types of music that she listens like in general, but also in terms of praise music. Like all of the names that, that people spoke were not the names that... Um, you know, that her other church would speak. So it's pretty interesting. And it's, it's there. at the heart of it. It's a mimicry, right? Like you, it, it evolved. It was first, it uh, first, it was a mimicry of you two and then Coldplay and then Mumford and Sons. Like it was <laughs> everything reflected oh this, God. this like movement of a particular type of music. I've lost track since then. So I don't know who they're copying now, but uh <laughs> There's a debate on whether if you listen to Mumford and Sons, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing these days. <laughs> 
because all the youth pastors who really loved it back in the day, they've kind of haven't turned out super well. Well, you know? just... I, I was one of those. I'm going to put my hands <laughs> up. I, I admit it. I was. I took it. I took it personally. I was like, come on. Right. Right. I liked my cargo shorts and goatee, you know? <laughs> hey, you know, I'm, I'm understanding the space I take up in the world. I think we all can. I'm trying to in 2020. <laughs> all right. That was a good one. Um. All right, so I'm I'm taking it the absurd to the next level. What is classy for the Easter Bunny and trashy <laughs> for Santa Claus? Pastel colors, <laughs> <laughs> right? So Santa would look down on that because yeah. it's not that's bright funny. and vibrant, and it. That's I'm going to go with pastels. <laughs> <laughs> you're like you're a trashy Santa Claus. Get out of here That's right. <laughs> with your pastel colors. Those Can dull you colors. That Santa suit is like pastel, right? Or even your it's Christmas funny. tree lights pastel. No, that's <laughs> that just doesn't work. <laughs> that's funny. It's like some clip art thing at that point. Why well, I I uh, my two answers would be um, what's classy for the Easter Bunny, but um, trashy for Santa. Trashy yeah. for Santa Claus. I would say the first one is hiding stuff on your property. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the second would be uh, uh, shaking his butt. Like for a little Easter bunny, like shaking his little bunny tail. That's classy. Santa but for Santa does- Claus, that's a little trashy. You, you don't you don't think Santa does a little shimmy those first couple cookies that he eats? You don't on think a- like shaking his butt before he gets back? <laughs> that's trashy. <laughs> You know he's got to shake that. Stuff on the property. You know shake he's got to shake that to get down the chimney. Like he doesn't just glide down. He's got to kind of move a little bit. I'm, <laughs> he's got a shimmy. I, I think maybe your first. Doesn't one. he hide the presents too? I said on your property, oh. like outside. But he doesn't hide the presents. He displays the presents. So I, I like that one. Like Santa displays you. Everything should be seen. Easter Bunny's kind of shifty. Like you know, <laughs> like I'm going to hide this, mm-hmm. and uh, if, hopefully if you won't you find fr- it. Mm-hmm. Bit of a trickster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Easter Bunny's the higher consciousness of Santa Claus. Like Santa Claus, it's just you know this is the way it should be. The Easter Bunny goes beyond the mystery. They both try uh, very hard not to be seen. <laughs> That's but... true. No, well, just... <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Well, it's the opposite, right? The <laughs> Santa wants his stuff to be seen, but he himself does not want to be seen. So there's a, there's a humility there, and then. Easter Bunny <laughs> hides the stuff and prances around, and wants everyone to see them. So there's like a showmanship aspect to it. So I think that uh, the Easter Bunny is, um, you know, we just have an episode Easter Bunny versus uh, Santa, and just kind of. <laughs> well, I'm picking Jeff. Well, thank you, Bonnie, for your approval. Because I, I agree. what the heck? I didn't. <laughs> you offered two I different. Honestly, ones. thought hiding stuff on the property would win. A little butt shake. All right. Okay, Bonnie. Pastel, pastel colors. I mean, the visuals of funny. that is pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. All right. So mine is go, – I'm going with the mode that Bonnie went in. So I'm going to kind of create a ridiculous comparison. So what is classy for an animated character but trashy for a live action character? <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind – is really big eyes, like doing the wide eyes thing, like really wide all the time. I think for animated characters, when they have huge eyes, you're like, oh, that's cute. But if someone just like had their eyes super wide all the time, you'd be freaked out. Um, Like killing people. I mean, like, I'm thinking of like Tom and Jerry, like, you know, <laughs> like chasing and like smashing somebody because animation, they can come back to life. But if you're like a live action character, that's pretty messed up. That's true. Yeah, that's true. It would be disturbing. Like whoop, 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 whoop. And you smash someone like in, you know, a regular movie. Yeah. That would not be super. Like, or flattening. That, those are my favorite. Where they so like, just violence up, in general. You know, one dimensional. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you know what movie blurs the line between those things is uh Roger rabbit. I haven't seen it since I was a kid, so I can't really <laughs> right, remember right. all of it. I just remember them running someone over like the yeah. evil, like Nazi character, the little like, mob guy they run him over with the steamroller uh-huh. and then it, it becomes like very, well because they found out he was a character and then they disintegrated flat. him with acid so that was good wait what <laughs> he did what with acid 
they disintegrated him. Like that was the whole oh, yeah. point of the movie is the villain found a way to kill cartoon characters. Mm. That's very unclassy. Right. Right. But then <laughs> that reverses. Killing a cartoon character, that's like the least unclassy. Right. Uh. They, they take the thing that they view as classy, violence, and then it is used <laughs> against them and therefore becomes unclassy. I was going to say having someone draw me, <laughs> draw, having someone draw them. <laughs> but, but is it classy to have somebody draw you? Like a, like, you know, Titanic sort of thing? Draw me. It's, it's, I think, I think the, the real offense is when they are try to erase you, right? There've been cartoons like that where they have to run away from the eraser. Like the drawing is a life giving and the eraser is your existence is null and void. Okay. I'm going to go with drawing. I'm going to go with drawing. It's classy to have somebody draw you if you're a cartoon character. I think it's a little trashy in some of those like romance <laughs> movies where it's like, draw me like you draw all your other girls. <laughs> you know, like I think that's, there's a little level of trash. Oh, I was a lot, just a tiny bit. When, see, to me, th- when you say that, like that aspect of drawing is, is classy. But I was thinking like the caricature on the wharf, you know, where that guy's in the corner and he draws like all your exaggerated features as oh. a human, that that would be. Classy. No, that's classy in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that very seriously. Uh, because you you do not like flaws being pointed out in your physical appearance. And that's exactly like the whole point of that. No, I, I love those. That char- I love those I hate exaggerated those. things. I hate those. I think they're the worst thing in the world. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go. <laughs> but performative romance. I'm, I'm neutral. That, I don't care. Performative romance is the, is the thing that, that sets me off. I think that's not good. You know what I mean? Mm. That's the offensive thing. Right. This is a tough one. But ultimately, I'm going to go with Bonnie because I think there's some layers there with the violence aspect of it. That I think that. (laughs) That was pretty good. That was really good. good. I think the only time I can win is when Rajiv's not here. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what to think about that. Yeah, what do you want to say, Rajiv? Now about Rajiv, now's your chance. I know <laughs> he can't defend himself. I know, poor guy. Oh, that's funny. That was good. That was like that one. That was fun. We should. It uh, was fun. We we'll put that on the list to try to do a little bit later, um, when everyone else is is on the show. Yeah, that's something we should do. Discuss Santa Claus a little more. Yeah, let's stop talking about spiritual growth and let's talk about Santa's butt. That's what I want to do. <laughs> Santa shaking his butt. In pastel colors. That's right. He would be horribly <laughs> offended by those things. All right. <laughs> well, that will do it for us this week. If you enjoy Irenacast and would like uh, to join the work that we're doing, please consider donating to our PayPal link at irenacast.com slash PayPal. Uh, we're committed to keeping the show for free for listeners, but there are costs involved and your financial support helps. It's irenacast.com slash PayPal. And Irenacast is also a nonprofit organization so, organization, so your donations are tax deductible. You can also support the show by simply – Making sure you subscribe to the show on whatever platform you listen to. And if it allows it, leave a rating and a review. We just love to hear um, from our listeners. It It's fuel in the tank, so to speak. So uh, anytime you can reach out, we appreciate it. So for this week, I'm Jeff. It's your boy, Alan. And I'm Bonnie. Thanks for joining the conversation. <laughs>